Hi, hopefully in the last lecture I convinced you that synthesis is a really important part of drug discovery. So, where does synthesis come in? Well, it comes into every aspect of the drug discovery pipeline. All of those main six milestones that we talked about earlier in this course are impacted by synthesis. So, the roles of synthesis, uh, there's several for them. Uh, I'll break down into four main subtopics. The first is target identification. So, we want to find some kind of biological target that we can interact with via a small molecule. And we can actually find a target through synthetic methods. So we can tag a bioactive drug to help find its biological target. And that's going to be the main subject of this video. The second way that we can uh, involve synthesis in drug discovery is through lead discovery. So we can make synthetic libraries of compounds that allow us to find a lead compound that allows us to start the uh, drug discovery process. The third way, and probably the way that most people think that uh, synthetic chemistry can get involved, is through optimization of the lead. And this is really the domain of medicinal chemistry. Finally, at the stage of an investigational new drug through the clinical trials and clinical use, then synthetic chemists are really still vital. And this type of chemistry is normally referred to as process chemistry. How do we make the compound on scale? How do we make it efficiently? How do we make it in an environmentally friendly manner? and so on. But firstly, we're going to look at target identification and how synthesis, can, uh, how synthesis can get involved with that part of the drug discovery process. Okay, so target identification, we can identify regions of a molecule that can be altered that don't destroy the bioactivity. So once we've done that, we can then firstly either immobilize the compound on a solid support and then use that immobilized compound to capture the biological target, elute it off, and then identify what it is. Or B, we can incorporate what's called a photo affinity tag, expose the cells or a lysate from the cells to that photo affinity tag, irradiate the mixture with UV light, and then identify the tagged biological target. I'll go through these in a moment in more detail. Uh, we can also label the compound with fluorescent and radioactive tags to study cellular and whole body distribution. This is very often done in the uh, d drug discovery process. So the first of those two methods is to mobilize the lead compound onto a solid support. So we take the small molecule and we can immobilize it onto the solid substrate directly. And then we can get the protein extracts or the cell lysate and flush them through this column, the solid support of natural product, and any target that binds to the natural product should be bound to it and not flush away with the rest of the eluent. We can then do something to release that biological target from binding to the natural product, such as denature it or put in some of the free natural product that will compete with the biological target for binding, and we'll get our uh, biological target enriched out the other side. We can use more uh, complex, but actually in practice, much more convenient techniques such as biotin streptavidin affinity chromatography. So biotin, I'll talk about this in more detail later on in this video, but biotin has a really uh, amazing affinity for the biomolecule avidin. So biotin will stick to avidin almost like a covalent uh, bond. If we attach biotin to our natural product, when we get that construct and flush it through a column that exposes avidin, the avidin will bind to the biotin and display natural product on the solid surface. We then get the protein extracts for intact cells or cell lysate, flush it through the column, and once again, our targets will bind to the natural products and not be flushed through the column, and then we can do something to release those from the column such as denature the protein or uh, make, something, make it so that the biotin won't bind to the avidin any longer. Finally, and we'll go through this in a lot more detail in a moment, is photo affinity labeling. So we take a more complex construct where we have the natural product of our drug lead, we have a photo affinity label and biotin attached to it. We then uh, pass this through a column with avidin, the biotin binds to the avidin, and then we flush through the protein extracts for intact cells, but we do an extra step of irradiating that mixture with UV light. And that leads to a covalent bond being formed between this photo label and the uh, target proteins. So they're now covalently bound and there's going to be no dissociation between those components. 
We can then flush the column to get rid of this association between biotin and avidin and use all sorts of different techniques to work out what our targets are. So once we've got our proteins flushed off the bottom here, we can use things like SDS page, mass spectrometry, liquid chromatography, mass spec, mass spec, isotopic labeling, and all sorts of other techniques to try to identify what our protein target for our natural product or lead is. Okay, I mentioned this term photo affinity labeling. So what does that mean? Well, here's a little diagram of what it looks like. So we take our compound of interest, it could be a drug lead or a natural product, and we quite often will label it with something like biotin that will allow us to find it easily. And then we also modify the structure so that it has what we call a photo affinity label. So this is a group that becomes really highly reactive when you shine UV light on it. Now we take that labeled compound and we expose it to our cellular mixture, which has a receptor or some kind of target in it that is going to bind to our lead or our natural product. We get reversible binding, but hopefully it's strong enough that a large proportion of our target is bound to this uh, natural product or, or lead compound. We then shine a UV light on it, and that uh, turns this photo affinity label into a highly reactive species that forms a covalent bond between the receptor or our target and the compound itself. So now these will not dissociate. This is a irreversible process. So now we can take the, um, the covalently bound target with the natural product and this handle on it and subject it to some kind of analytical technique. So we could use SDS gel electrophoresis and identify the labeled target that way. Or we could break up this uh, target protein through proteolysis so we get peptide sequences, do HPLC purification, identify the labeled peptides, because now some of these peptides are actually going to be different molecular weight. They're going to have this natural product or lead compound plus some kind of handle attached to them. So they might be easy to spot through our analytical technique. We can even break them up further into their individual amino acids. And we may find that particular amino acids are labeled with our particular compound and we can identify those easily through techniques like mass spec. Okay, so that's a little snapshot of how to do photo affinity labeling. What kind of groups can we use for this photo affinity labeling? So there's a, a number of different photoactivatable groups that we can use. One group are azides. So if you look over here, azides form these reactive nitrines through a loss of nitrogen. Diazo compounds can lose nitrogen to form carbenes, whereas diazonium salts form cover cations as the reactive intermediate. And diazorenes, which are these interesting three-membered rings over here, they form carbenes uh, through photoactivation and all of these different groups, nitrines, carbenes, cover cations and carbenes are highly reactive. They don't exist for very long before they react with the target which the compound is bound to. One of the most common groups that is used in modern drug discovery for photo affinity labeling are aryl trifluoromethyl diazorane. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but it just turns out that the trifluoromethyl group suppresses side reactions such as uh, isomerization of the diazo group. So many of these uh, uh, photoactivatable groups can isomerize or undergo some other types of chemistry whereas diazorines are relatively stable until you shine the UV light onto them. So their excellent chemical stability prior to photolysis allows us to do a lot of synthetic chemistry on them and that allows us to incorporate them into really what can sometimes be quite delicate molecules, particularly in the case of natural products. One disadvantage of these types of molecules is that it can be synthetically challenging to build up these molecules because now we're looking at a fairly complex group that could take some synthetic steps to introduce into our, our natural product or our, our drug lead. Okay, so a little bit more about carbenes and nitrines. Photo affinity labeling relies on the photochemical generation of these highly reactive short-lived intermediates. Carbenes and nitrines are commonly employed as they are really highly reactive. They're uncharged, yet they're electron deficient because they only have six valence electrons. We know that main, uh, main group elements want to have uh, their octet satisfied, the octet rule. And so these compounds are seeking out additional bonding partners to form new bonds, and that's what they do with the target to which the compound is bound to. 
Typical reactions they undergo are things like insertion into uh, heteroatom hydrogen bonds, carbon hydrogen bonds, and insertion into pi bonds such as carbon-carbon double bond. So carbene reactivity, for example, a diazo compound, we can get loss of nitrogen when you shine a UV light onto the compound. We can generate two different types of carbenes, singlet or triplet carbenes. We're not so interested in the difference between the two for this course, but by all means look it up in your organic chemistry textbook. But both of these types of intermediate can insert into these uh, either heteroatom or carbon hydrogen bonds, which are abundant within proteins and other biomolecules to which your um, lead molecule or your natural product may be binding to. So the photo affinity label or tag that we can put onto the molecule is good. We can get a covalent attachment of the molecule onto the uh, protein target. But once we form that covalent adduct, how do we actually find that molecule amongst the mixture of compounds or mixture of uh, biological molecules that we might, might have? It could be present in very small quantities. Traditionally, radioactive labels have been used. So we could use tritium or carbon-14 or other radioactive isotopes and put them into our, our substrate that then gets covalently attached and we can use radiochemical means to find that, that covalently attached uh, compound in the whole uh, biological milieu. However, more recently, biotin labeling has been favored because you get around a lot of the problems associated with radiochemistry, uh, such as having to use radiochemical techniques and all of the safety issues that go along with that. The biotin tagging is really useful because of the strong complex that biotin forms with the biomolecule avidin, which has a dissociation constant of around 10 to the minus 15 moles per liter. This is incredibly strong binding. It's not a covalent bond, but it's almost as strong as one, and it's for all intents and purposes like having an irreversible covalent bond. So we can use this in affinity purification, where we have an immobilized avidin displayed on the outside of a insoluble matrix. We can then use biotin avidin complex via a detection method called chemiluminescent detection, where we generate a chemiluminescent output through peroxidase activity, which has been conjugated to the avidin. The detection limit for this process is around 10 to the minus 14 moles, which is incredibly sensitive and is comparable to radioisotopic methods. The disadvantage of this type of approach, as opposed to the radioisotopes, is that biotin is a relatively large and polar group. And so maybe it could affect the biological, uh, biological activity of the molecule in which you're attaching it to. Whereas if we're just replacing a hydrogen with a tritium or a carbon with a carbon-14, we're really not changing the size or properties of that molecule in a biological context. So to summarize, uh, chemical probes uh, can be formed from natural products or lead compounds by linking them to fluorescent or photoaffinity or biotin tags. We can use these to identify the binding proteins or the localization of active molecules within cells of interest such as cancer cells, malaria parasites, and so on. Hopefully you found this interesting, and we're going to demonstrate this through a case study where it's been used to identify new targets in the discovery of new anti-cancer agents. Thanks a lot.